Praise the Lord. Well, slowly, we're seeing God's hand in things, and we're just thankful that we can be here once again to praise the Lord. Can we put up this scripture, please? Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, and chapter twenty-nine. Second Chronicles twenty-nine and verse twenty-five. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 29, verse 25. just want us to see something that will help us this morning, hopefully. This is a Hezekiah's celebration of the Passover. The Bible says this was one of the greatest meetings that they'd ever had in the Bible. Never been celebrated as good as this for hundreds of years. So he stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and liars in the way prescribed by David and Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet. This was commanded by the Lord through his prophets so that their worship and their praise and the things in the temple, it was actually a command by God to do this. Next verse. The priests then slaughtered the goats and presented their blood on the altar of a sin offering to atone for all Israel because the king had ordered the burnt offering and the sin offering for all Israel. Next verse. Just notice what's actually happening here when they're worshipping God. Hezekiah gave the order. Where have we gone? So the Levites stood ready with David's instruments and the priests with their trumpets. Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offering on the altar as the offering began, singing to the Lord, began also accompanied by trumpets, and the instruments of David, king of Israel. One more verse. The whole assembly bowed in worship while the musicians played and the trumpets sounded. All this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offering was completed. When the offerings were finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshipped. You'll notice there that there's different things happening. There's a, there's a sacrifice being given. The burnt offering, the animal has to die. That was actually the primary focus. It wasn't the music at all. The primary focus was on what was dying so that those people could be forgiven. Our primary focus this morning is Jesus. It actually says in the prescribed order that the musicians played their music, yeah? The whole assembly then bowed in worship while the musicians played and the trumpets sounded. All this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offering was completed. The, the people weren't there listening to the music. Can you see that? As the music was playing, the people were bowing in worship. They weren't even necessarily singing along to the songs. You see, when we make music our worship, we actually confuse the issue. Praise was to accompany the worship. It wasn't the worship. All the musicians were playing, and as the, the musicians were playing the instruments, the people were actually bowing in worship. Twice it's mentioned there. They bow in worship as they hear the music. So sometimes we can confuse just singing praise with worship. They're not the same thing. I know we mentioned this over and over again. But in the, in the modern Christian world, people just assume they're both the same thing and they're not. The music is to help us worship. So as the, as the priests and the Levites were playing the instruments and singing the praise and they were focusing on the sacrifice, all the people, as the music were playing, were actually bowing in worship. Actually, the word worship, shakar in Hebrew, means to bow down. That's literally what it means. And so, we haven't got our musicians here today. We're going to play the music. That doesn't affect your worship at all. Not in the biblical sense. We might not be able to sing our praise because of the restrictions. That doesn't alter the worship. It only alters the worship if you've misunderstood what worship is. The worship was what they were doing as the music was playing. So although we haven't got our musicians here, 
to lead us in this praise and worship, we can still follow the biblical order of worshipping God as the music's playing. doesn't affect it. Not if it's real. doesn't affect it at all. And so, whilst it's limited this morning, and we've just got a couple of songs that we're going to play, as the music was playing, the people worshipped. As we're listening to the music, because we still can't sing at the moment, that might change in the coming weeks, you can still quietly say the words to yourself. You can still worship. In fact, your worship isn't actually affected if you understand what worship is. So as we play these songs, we're going to worship the Lord, just as they did in the Bible, just as they always have throughout history, just as people today in countries where they're not allowed to meet because of persecution, they'll still meet and worship God. They wouldn't be able to play any music because they have to meet in secret, but they still worship God. And so we're going to worship the Lord this morning, amen? Come on then, let's stand together in the presence of the Lord. Let's just close our eyes. You know, we're going to play these songs that our musicians have written, beautiful songs, I love them very much. They're going to help us. They're going to provide a, a mental and an emotional condition that helps us worship but your worship is what you give to God as you focus on the sacrifice that Jesus gave that's what worship is you're going to give your thanks and your worship to God as we hear the praise helping us do that so let's focus on the Lord right now father thank you that you provided the sacrifice Lord when those worshipers came to your temple Lord in the old testament you provided the music you provided the environment, the, the temple that had been cleansed and hygienically conditioned to be sacred, Lord, for people. But the important thing that you wanted, Lord, was worship. You said you seek worshipers who worship you in spirit and truth. So, Lord, as, as these songs play now, we're going to worship you as we focus on who you are and what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Come on, let's worship the Lord as these songs of praise play. Let's lift our hands, lift our heads and worship the Lord. Let's worship God. The sky is covered with colour only you can make The earth is full of mountains only you can shake the world is full of oceans, you make me the shore. You are the Heavenly Father, I want to know you more. So I will seek you. With color only you can make Nations are full of people only you can shake The rocks and creatures in all the earth declare your praise You are the Heavenly Father or I will seek your face So I will seek you
Come on. God's with us. So what's God doing at the minute? You know, a lot of people are, are saying, well, what a, what, what a weird year. Yeah? This has been the worst year of my life. Yeah? Well, it has. When I look at everything that's been happening in all areas of my life, I just think, this is rubbish. I, I, which is strange, because last year was one of the best years in my life and ministry and family. But this year, it's just been like, what on earth is going on? Just so many problems hitting us all at the same time. And people are asking questions. Well, what, is, this, is this a judgment from God? Is, is God doing something? Well, let me tell you, God's always doing something. The problem is people don't understand what he's doing. And that's what we're going to look at this morning because they don't understand who God is or how he works or what his word says or what his spirit's doing and they've not listened to God. So when God does do something, they don't understand. They can't, they can't read the signs. You know, if you don't learn to read, if someone gives you a book, you can't read it. You have to learn to read to read a book. You have to spend time with God, listening to God, before you understand what God's doing. You won't just understand what God's doing unless you've already been listening to him. And, uh, you know, this, this pandemic, this plague that's hit the whole world and it's crashed the economies, and we don't yet know what that means because we live on borrowed money in our economies. We, it, that's going to be years before we fully realize what's happened and how that's going to affect everybody. And everybody's really happy because the government's giving them money. Let, do you know the government doesn't have any money? You do know that, don't you? What that means is they need more taxes from us to give more money to people. So when everyone's happy that the government's giving them money, that means you're going to have to give more to pay for all that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just talking basic economics. And so what's happening? You know, in the Bible, uh, God sent Moses to Egypt and he sent him to deliver, to bring freedom to his people but the freedom to God's people meant judgment on Egypt. You know the story of all the plagues in Egypt? And those two things had to happen at the same time. Because when God wants to bring us deliverance, he wants to, de to deliver us, to set us free from all the problems in the world. So for God to help you, he has to bring judgment on the world. Jesus was always clear, judgment now comes on this world, but I have come that you may be free. I have come that you may have life. But for God to give us life, he has to show us what doesn't give life by bringing judgment on that. And Jesus has clearly told us that the world is going to go through judgment and it's going to get worse till it reaches a climax. But Jesus says the judgment will be so bad if God doesn't step in at the end, no one will survive. Jesus clearly tells us that in the Bible over and over again. It's one of his, it's actually, it's one of his primary teachings. And so Moses came to Egypt, and he came to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he says, right, God is going to bring judgment on you. It's going to be plagues, and he's going to give you signs, and stuff's going to go wrong in Egypt with the economy, and with the agriculture, and with the health systems, and, and with all these things, God's going to bring judgment, and you're going to recognize who God is through it. And so he came, and he, he threw his staff down, and his his staff turned into a snake, you know the story. But all the wise men and the politicians and the, the people of Egypt says, well, we don't believe in your God. We believe in our systems. And so they did things that counteracted what Moses did. So they threw their staffs down and they says, oh, we can do that. And so then Moses went and turned the, the Nile into blood and the Egyptians says, oh, we're not bothered about that. So you've created a problem for us. We can work our way around that and they started to dig and make wells and we, we will figure it out by our own wisdom. We're not going to believe in God. Not your God anyway. We're going to believe in our gods. And so then he brought the plague of frogs. And what did they do? They said exactly the same things. Oh, that's no big deal. And one of the things we don't understand is each of the plagues that Moses brought on the Egyptians, the things that that were affected were gods of Egypt. They worshipped the Nile, so he turned the Nile into blood. They worshipped frogs. 
They worshipped cattle, so the plague came on the cattle. Uh, they, worship, they, they believed they were gods, apis bulls they called them. And so Moses was showing them the things they trusted in were going to fail. What did they do? They says, well, never mind. We're still not going to turn to God. We're not going to let free, God bring freedom. What we're going to do is we're just going to invent a new system to get around what you've done. The frogs, well, perhaps it was just a natural phenomenon. And then, and then the insects, the, the Egyptians worshipped insects. They actually worshipped beetles, uh, scattered beetles. They, they worshipped all these things. You know, in our society, we might think we don't worship other gods, but we do. We worship the economy. We worship education. We worship politics. We worship economics. We worship all of these things. And so God will show that all of these things don't work. They will fail. And what are you going to do when it fails? Well, we've got the health system. What are you going to do when the health system fails? Oh, it'll never fail. Oh, it will. It doesn't have the answer to all medical problems. Not at all. And, and God works in this way. Now, let's go to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 17. Exodus 8 and verse 17. And so the Bible tells us that every time God did something to show them the trouble they were in and how they should turn to him. It says, Pharaoh hardened his heart and says, I'm not going to turn to God. I'm going to invent a new political economic system to get round this. I can guarantee, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd be over the moon if this happened, but I can guarantee if I click on the news this afternoon, there will be from all the wise leaders of our nation a way to get out of the problem we're in. And I can guarantee one of them will not be, let's have three days of prayer and fasting and all the nation turn to God. I'm pretty sure the Prime Minister is not going to say that. In fact, they won't even mention God. They'll act as though he's not there. Which means the problem usually gets worse. And so another plague happened. So they did this when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust. Now there's still a lot more plagues to come. This is not even halfway through. Struck the dust of the ground. Gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. Now the, flo the frogs had disappeared. So everyone was happy that the frogs had disappeared. Uh, recently, during lockdown, I took Isaac. We went up to the pond behind our house and we got a big lump of... Uh, tadpoles, and we put them in our pond to watch them turn into frogs. And I reckon we had about 500 tadpoles, thinking the fish would eat them, so I weren't that bothered. <laughs> it saves me, saves me buying fish food. But the fish didn't eat them. And so we literally had 500 frogs running around the garden. Now, to start with, it was fun. Like, look at all these little baby frogs hopping everywhere. And then until I suddenly realized they were everywhere. And the more you look, the more you see the grass moving. Now, I'm colorblind, so I can't tell the difference between reds and greens. So the, I couldn't see the... I could just see stuff moving in the grass. And then we were scared to cut the grass because we didn't want dead frogs splattering all over, the, <laughs> all over the garden. So it was quite fun, but I'm glad, I'm glad they're going now. But when the frogs went, what do frogs eat? Gnats. So when the frogs go, it just creates another problem. Because now, one of the miracles of all these things in Egypt was not just the plagues, it's how quickly they disappeared. But because they didn't turn to God, there was another problem coming that was worse than the problem before. What if that's what's happening now? You see, we're all hoping, oh, suddenly everything's going to get better. What if it gets worse? We don't, we don't factor that in. We're looking forward to everything getting better. Jesus says in the last days, things will get worse and worse. He says people's hearts will wax worse and worse. People's love will get less. People's obedience will get less. People's faith will get less. He says everything will get worse. That's the opposite of secular humanism, that we believe, according to Darwinian theory, that everything's getting better, but it isn't. And so this happens. Read the next verse. But when the magicians, now the word magi in, in the Bible 
where we get the word magistrate. It, it, it doesn't mean, you know, people who do magic. It means people who rule, the wise counsellors of Egypt, the politicians, we would say, the people running the country, the wise men and the magicians, tried to produce gnats by their secret arts. They could not, since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere. Suddenly a problem comes and they say, we don't know what to do about this. Now, they wouldn't have admitted that on TV because politicians have to pretend they've got the answer, don't they? Or they get ridiculed in the media. But these, these, at least these were honest, saying, we don't know what to do. We haven't got the answer. We, we can't, we, we've no solution to this. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. You see, the Lord had already said, look, even when I do stuff, people aren't going to listen. You've got to understand that. It's got nothing to do with how logical or truthful it is or what I'm doing. People's hearts are hard. They don't want to listen. They would rather go through anything than have to turn back to me. But the wise men, they said this phrase, this is the finger of God. We don't know what to do. This is God. God is in this. But they use an expression that's only used a few times in the Bible. This is the finger of God. He et ba Elohim in Hebrew. It's only used a few times. And it's always used of a very specific thing. You see, when God gets his finger out, you're in trouble. When something is described as the finger of God, you better start listening. Because it means God is doing something very specific. It's not just something God said. It's not just got God's uh, natural attributes that are happening, creation going on as normal, which is all controlled by God. No, no. God is putting his finger on a situation and he's not going to take it off until you listen. And if you don't listen, it will get worse. Till ultimately, Egypt would be totally destroyed because they would not listen. Look at, uh, go to Exodus chapter 10 and verse 7. This is towards the end of the plagues. There's still even worse plagues to come after this. There's going to be the plague upon the firstborn. There's going to be death on a massive scale towards the end of the plagues. Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not yet realize that Egypt is ruined? Don't you know it's over? We're, we've collapsed. The economy's gone. The agriculture's gone. The animals are dead. The crops have failed. The, the hail's come. We've got nothing to eat. Everything has just gone. You don't even realize that yet? You don't realize how bad it's now getting? They said, this is the finger of God. So you've got people here recognizing what's happening. And then you've got people hardening their hearts and just rejecting what's happening. I suggest we recognize what God's doing. Whatever God is doing. I'm not claiming I know everything God's doing. Only God knows that. But what is God doing? He et ba Elohim. This is the finger of God. You know, Carolyn always used to say, she knows when I'm mad because I get my finger out. I remember once we, we'd only been married a little bit and um, we had a disagreement over something. I think we were in, uh, I think we were in Wix buying some paint. Is that right, darling? And she bought the wrong color paint. Not, not because she'd misunderstood, but because... She didn't want to do what I wanted. And I said, you've bought my wrong color. And she looked at me. We'd not been married long. And she said to me, she said this afterwards, you've never got your finger out and pointed at me like that. She says, I knew you were mad because you did that. I didn't shout or anything. I just... Is this the finger of God? What if it is? What does the finger of God even mean? 
Even the Egyptians went, this is the finger of God. We better be very careful what we do now or it's over for us. Our country's over, our economy, our system, it's all over. Everything we trust in, it's gone. We better, we better start to decide what we're going to do right now. A lot of people are just, oh, don't worry, everything will be okay. That is the wrong response. If it's God, it's done so that we turn to him. It's not done just so that we can just hope everything will be okay and then carry on as normal. That's not why God does things. And so the finger of God in the Bible, as we say, this is only mentioned a few times. It's only half a dozen or so times that you find this phrase, the finger of God. Look at Luke chapter 11 and verse 20. So now this is in the time of Jesus. You see, Jesus came to bring God's reality to people. And he was healing people and he was driving out demons. And what were people doing? They were saying, this is not God. They were saying, Jesus is not God. In fact, in this account, when you read in the other Gospels, when Jesus did these things, they actually said it was the devil doing it. I mean, it's one thing to be indifferent, but when you start saying that God is the devil and good is evil, you're, your society is in big trouble. When you start saying God's laws are, are wicked and wicked laws are good, that society is finished. It's over. What does Jesus say? If I drive out demons, he ets ba Elohim. And he says a phrase that every single Jew knew what that phrase meant. By the finger of God. Jesus purposely used that phrase. He didn't just say I do it by my power or holiness or uh, through my authority. He says I'm doing it by the finger of God. Have you got it yet? Jesus was there to destroy wickedness in the spiritual realm. And that's why he drove out demons. Do you know until Jesus drove out demons, no one drove out demons? All the way through the Bible. David would sing a psalm and a demon might be pacified, but the demon would always come back. Only Jesus had authority over evil spirits. They should have known just from that he was God, because no one else had that authority. No one else could drive out demons. Unless Jesus gave them authority to do it. If I'm doing this by the finger of God. Jesus wasn't just doing miracles. He was showing that in the spiritual realm, the realm they couldn't see, the, the realm behind the scenes, the bits they couldn't understand, Jesus was saying, this is the finger of God. Have you got it yet? Do you understand what God is doing? It's being demonstrated right in front of your eyes and you are not only not listening, you're actually saying what I'm doing is wicked. And that's when Jesus uttered those terrible statements. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, neither in this age or the age to come. If you genuinely think God is evil, there is no hope for you. You cannot be saved. What did Pharaoh do? He just hardened his heart. There's, who's the Lord? I don't obey him. I obey myself. Well, Egypt's ruined then. And your kingdom's over. And everything's going to get destroyed. Because you're not recognizing the finger of God. Jesus was saying, God is here right now. Do you recognize that yet? Or are you just waiting to see what will happen? Jesus is saying, you're not going to see anything, any bigger demonstration than this. Because this is the finger of God. I'm doing things by the finger of God. What I'm doing is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That power is here right now. Do you recognize that? Even the Egyptians, the wise Egyptians went, this is the finger of God. We don't know what to do. We can't handle this. You see, everything God does has two aspects to it. Obviously, God wants to reveal his glory, his love, his power. God wants to reveal who he is to us. God always works in that way. He wants to give us grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's why he came. That's why he speaks. That's why he does everything. But there's always the other aspect to it. He wants to show you how hopeless your situation is. And he needs you to understand that without him, you won't make it. 
Because if God just gives you his grace and his love and all his blessings, but you still think you're okay and you can do it on your own, you'll take God's good things, but then you'll still live a selfish life according to your own plan. God has to show you both. God has to bring both. So Jesus brings the finger of God into the situation. And what did they do? They didn't recognize it. They just blasphemed God. How many people actually mock God when disasters happen? Where was God in that? Well, God was there all along, where he's always been. But before the disaster happened, you didn't turn to God either. You mocked God, and now you mock God when something happens. So really, you mock God whatever happens. It's got nothing to do with logic. Look at John chapter 8 and verse 4. John chapter 8 and verse 4. It's a very famous passage. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees, whose hearts were hard against what Jesus was doing, they weren't listening to God. They thought they were, but they were just doing their own thing. So they brought a woman caught in adultery to Jesus. They said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. They just wanted to bring condemnation into the situation. They just wanted to accuse God and accuse Jesus and accuse this woman. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, unless you understand the biblical context, you might not really know what that means. And I've heard a lot of well-meaning people say all kinds of stuff about what he was doing. I'll tell you what Jesus was doing. When they were misunderstanding the situation and they were just trying to bring judgment and condemnation, not grace, Jesus knew his words were not going to have any effect. So he got his finger out. And as soon as he took his finger out and started to point on the ground, every single one of those new Jews knew what that meant. He didn't say anything. You see, when God gets his finger out, you better start listening. It's no good asking him for more words. They'd had all the words. They weren't listening. So now he's got his finger out. And I've heard people say he started to write in the dust. This was on the temple mount in the, in the temple precincts. There was no dust. Everything was pained tablets of stone. What was Jesus doing? He was getting his finger out and he was starting to write on tablets of stone. You see, one of those commandments is you shall not commit adultery. But there's a lot of other commandments as well. And when God wrote the commandments, it says they were written by the finger of God. He etz ba Elohim. And so every one of those Jews knew exactly what, what was happening. They were using it as a question to trap him. Go to the next verse. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, the elders first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Let's go down. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman... Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. What's going on here? God, once again, is getting his finger out. What are the people doing? What are these Jewish people doing? They're demanding that Jesus gives them a condemnation and an accusation and a judgment on this woman. People do that today. I want to know why God's doing this. I want you to judge that person. Why haven't you done this? People accuse the church of that. I get accused of that all the time. Why have you done this? Why haven't you done that? And they want me to pass a judgment on a situation. And they want God to do something. God needs to do something. God needs to punish that person. And God needs to condemn that person. And God needs to address that person. Oh, you want God to get his finger out, do you? If you want God to get his finger out, you better get ready. 
Because he's not just going to judge what you want to judge. He's going to judge everything in everybody's life. The whole of Egypt was under the finger of God. And so the minute Jesus gets his finger out and starts to write, now remember, they've said we should stone this woman. Now, if you've, in the temple precincts, there were huge stone tablets on the ground. It was a, a paved area. It was immaculate. It was clinically clean to uh, fulfill the Jewish regulations. They wanted Jesus to throw a stone at this woman. And Jesus points down at this huge slab stone. You want me to throw a stone at her, do you? Thou shalt not commit adultery. What about thou shalt not covet? What about thou shalt not bear false testimony? Which is what you lot are doing right now. The, the Jews, not you. And you can see why the older ones, the wiser ones, started to think, whoa, hold on a minute. This is the finger of God. I better be very careful demanding judgment on someone when that judgment can also come on me. I might throw a stone at this woman. What if God throws that stone at me? That'll, that'll take my head off. I might be more guilty than she is. And they started to go away. Why? They recognized the finger of God, what it meant. Do we recognize it? Because it's revealed in many ways. They wanted judgment, but be very careful when you demand judgment. Because if you, if you enter into the process of judgment, you will be judged. Judge not, lest ye be judged. The finger of God will make sure of that. When you point at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you. Look at Isaiah 58, verse 9. You see, there's certain things God hates. Do you know one of the things God hates? In the Bible, it's called the pointing of the finger. God hates it when we point the finger. So when I pointed at my wife over the wrong paint, I was under the judgment of God. But she's forgiven me, so I'm okay. Oh, well, we got the paint she wanted anyway. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, it's mentioned here, it's mentioned in many other passages. Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of the finger and the malicious talk, God's saying, you better not start pointing your finger or I might get my finger out. And I might start pointing at things in your life. And when the he etzbat Elohim comes out, we're all in trouble. Don't do it. We need to be very careful what is going on because when you bring in that accusation you remember Pharaoh was claiming to be God and the Egyptians weren't releasing the people and they were just oppressing them they were pointing the finger and saying you point your finger at my people get rid of you I'm going to point my finger at you and when I point my finger at you you aren't going to survive you remember the story of David and, and uh, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and, and the, the prophet brought that revelation to him what do we do this man and David says that man deserves to die he has to pay fourfold for what he's done and Nathan says you're the man it's you that's done it you've just said you've just said he's going to pay fourfold do you know four of David's sons died because he passed judgment on someone else that he himself had done God says I now have to punish you by the very words you you condemn somebody else The finger of God. You see, as we said, it's only mentioned a few times. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10. This is what Jesus was actually doing when he bent down and started to write on the tablets of stone. He was actually acting out once again the finger of God, as mentioned in the Old Testament. And that's why all the Jews knew what was going on. That's why they walked away. They weren't going to mess with the finger of God. So the Lord gave Moses two stone tablets inscribed by the He Etzba Elohim, the finger of God. On them were all the commandments the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of the 
assembly. You see, the finger of God is not just seen through what God's doing in the world. Primarily, the finger of God is seen through what God's already said and written down. The Bible was written by the finger of God. It's not a set of rules and guidance that the government's made up because they're panicking and don't know what to do next. It is the finger of God writing his word so that we can recognize what God has said. You can't change that. Now, the ceremonial laws, but these laws, especially the Ten Commandments, they're written by the finger of God. You can't break those without consequences because it's written by the finger of God. It's not just good practice or good advice. It's written by the finger of God. Do we recognize that? Do you know that the Bible is God's word to you in ultimate authority? Do you know it's written by the finger of God? So if we don't obey God's word, Pharaoh and the Egyptians weren't obeying God's word, so okay, that, that finger that wrote that word is coming out. And that's not going to be good. Because if you've transgressed God's finger through his word, if you've not listened to what God's written, if you've not observed what God is doing by driving out evil like Jesus was doing by the finger of God, and you've not listened to his word by the finger of God, guess what? God's going to get his finger out and, and trouble's coming. Because God loves us too much for us to destroy our lives. He has to bring us into a situation where we will turn to him because he knows we won't make it on our own. God's word is written by the finger of God. Proverbs 7, verse 3. Have you, ever re have you ever wondered why God told the Israelites to do something? He told them to write his laws on their fingers. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Do you still do this today? Sometimes they bind them on phylacteries. They tie them around their head. They bind them on their arms in strips of leather with God's word written on them. Why is God saying that? Why, why write God's word on your fingers? Why bind God's laws on your fingers? God's word to you, why put it on your fingers? So that every time you get your finger out, you remember what that means. Every time you write something, just remember who's really doing the writing. When you're tempted to point that finger, remember there's another finger going to point at you. When we ignore God and reject him and turn him out of our society, let's remember he's going to get his finger out. It will happen. And the Jews, every time, oh, hold on a minute, what's that on my finger? Oh, yes. I've got to speak the truth. I can't, I can't lie. I can't take God's name in vain. I, I, I can't sin. I can't steal. I can't even covet things that I, I want things I shouldn't want. I better be very careful. Because the finger of God is very real. We have to obey what God has said. Because if we don't, that finger's coming out. And it doesn't just come out for individuals. God points his finger on a whole nation. Sometimes God points his finger on a whole empire. A whole group of nations. Look at Daniel. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 5. Daniel 5 and verse 5. I'm sure you know this story very, very well. The, the Babylonian king. God said to Babylon, you've got 70 years. And then I'm going to judge you. And literally, to 70 years to the exact year, the king of Babylon decided to throw a party where they would mock God. And the king of Babylon, he, he took God's sacred vessels, the communion vessels, the goat, and, and he started to get drunk, and they started to just have a party and praise their own gods and mock God. We are Babylon. We know how to run the world. We are the main empire. We are the main political system. Our systems of education and economics and, and government, that's what counts. We don't need God. We're going to mock God by ridiculing him, by using the things he's built just to give ourselves pleasure. Does that sound familiar? Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched 
the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. That, that's, that's the way that the, this version of the Bible translates that. The actual uh, King James says his, his loins were loosed. If you don't know what that means, I don't want to be any more graphic than that. Basically, he was so scared, that's what he did. What is happening? He's just seen the finger of God. And the finger just writes four words on the, on the wall, many, many tekel parsin, which they didn't understand, so they called for Daniel. God says, you've been judged. Weight, weight, balance, division. You've been judged. Your kingdom's been judged. You've mocked God. It's over now. You've had your 70 years. Tonight, God is going to take your kingdom from you. And that night, Babylon, that very night, Babylon was attacked by the Persians and the Persians took over the kingdom and the king was killed and the empire ended. You see, God does judge nations. He says, oh, you've taken all my stuff and now you're mocking me with it? You see, Babylon was, God said he built Babylon up to reveal his truth to the world through what he did with the Jewish people. It, it was God that was doing it, and now this country was mocking God. We don't need God yet, but this country was built by God. And now you're making fun of God? It's over. The finger of God's here now. Daniel says it's over. The finger of God is out. 70 years. It's, it's interesting how many... That 70 years crops up. It, it, I find it amazing that the, the Soviet Union, you know, a godless, atheistic, secular humanism that mocked God, rejected God, killed Christians, persecuted the Jews. You know, the, the Soviet Union started just after the First World War. 70 years later, it collapsed. The Berlin Wall came down. I'm wondering about China now, another atheistic, secular society that persecutes Christians and denies the existence of God, is 70 years are up this year. You don't mock God and get away with it. Very foolish thing to do. Whoever you are, never mock God. God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. He, they recognize God's hand. Daniel recognized God's hand. He actually said to him, he says, your father, Nebuchadnezzar, when he's recognized God's hand, he repented and said, this is the true God. He says, you've mocked him. And so it's over for you. Let's draw this to a conclusion then. Look at Psalm 8, verse 3. Psalm 8 and verse 3. You see, people say, well, if I've not read the Bible or I'm not up to speed on world events or I don't see miracles or I don't see any of these things. How do I know there's a God? Oh, you know. Oh, you know. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You see, everybody knows there's something greater than what they're experiencing. Everybody knows that. You can see the finger of God in creation. You can see the finger of God in mankind. You know man is different than everything else. Every single person in this room knows that. Everybody watching this video knows that. You know you're not just an animal. You know that. You don't, you, even people who say they, they just think we evolved from sludge. I mean, even saying that sounds dumb, doesn't it? So you're really saying that man is no different than a rock. Just time and chance happened to a rock and it turned into a dinosaur that evolved into a monkey, which is us. That all came out of nothing. Just say that again. You really believe that, do you? Yes. No, you don't. When you hold your little child in your arms, you don't think this has no more value than a rock. You don't believe that for one minute. You know human life has value. Value beyond an inanimate object. We all know that. You know, at the minute, everyone's saying this lives matter thing, isn't it? You know, black lives matter, white lives matter, all lives matter. Let's write one for the atheistic secularist. No lives matter. 
because it has no meaning. It's just a st- it's not just stop being ridiculous. We all know life has meaning. We can look at the creation and think this is a miracle. How on earth did this happen? It's not an accident. We can see the finger of God in everything. You can see the finger of God in every life, every person, everything. You can see that, that man, why is God mindful of man? Because he created you by his finger. He bent down and he picked up the dust with his fingers and he made you and then he breathed his life into you. And you know that, whoever you are, you know you're not a rock, a piece of dust. You know, you see the finger of God in it, whoever you are. Let's stop being foolish. And Jesus was the greatest demonstration of the finger of God. And so finally, let's just look at Jesus again. Mark chapter 7, verse 33. Mark chapter 7, verse 33. You see, when Jesus healed, he would sometimes do something very strange. You know, Jesus just could heal with a word. Jesus could heal without touching anybody. But then sometimes, just to prove to the Jews what was going on, like he cast out the demons by the finger of God, sometimes he'd do this. A man who's blind and, uh, and, and, and mute, can't speak. So, sorry, deaf and can't speak. He did heal blind men in the same way. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh, said to him, If after, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plainly. What's Jesus doing here? Why doesn't he just say, be healed? Why does he get his finger out? I mean, what a weird thing to do. You come to Jesus for healing. That's fine. I'm going to spit on my finger and I'm going to stick it in your ear. And they didn't have, you know, cotton buds in those days. So his ear weren't very clean. And then the finger that he spat on and he's adding his ear, he's then going to put in his mouth. That would break hygiene protocols, wouldn't it, Dr. Mark? I mean, how many of you, any, anyone want healing today? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come here. Let me just stick my fingers in your ears and then put it in your mouth. Oh, it was different in their culture. It was worse in their culture. In their culture, spitting made you ceremonially unclean. You didn't touch people who were Samaritan. You certainly didn't put your fingers in their ears and then spit on it and then put it in the mouth. I mean, what on earth is Jesus doing here? I mean, it's bonkers, isn't it? I'm sure some of us wouldn't come to church if Jesus was here. Not that he is here, but you know what I mean. It's like, what is he doing? He's demonstrating something that all the Jews would recognize. He etz ba Elohim. This is the finger of God. And as Jesus puts his finger on you, you can hear God's voice. And when Jesus puts his finger on you, you can speak God's words. We can see the finger of God throughout creation. We can read it in his word. We can see it through what's happening in the world and the judgments that God's bringing. Even the wicked Egyptians said, this is the finger of God. We better be very careful what's going on now. We need to start listening. What if things in our society don't get better? What if they get worse? What is it going to take us to recognize that God's hand is on this and he wants us to turn to him and he wants us to put our faith in him? When Jesus put his finger on this man, his ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, And he began to speak plainly. Do you know what he did after this? He went around telling everybody how great Jesus was. Why? Because he'd experienced the finger of God. Our society might not be recognizing it. But there are many people who do recognize it. He etz ba Elohim. This is the finger of God. Do we believe that? Do we recognize it? Are we going to do something about it? 
by turning to God? Or are we just going to wait till things get worse when it will be even harder to turn to him? Because our situation will be worse. We need to turn to God now. Because Jesus says in the last days, things will get worse, not better. He actually says things will get rapidly worse, speedily, acceleratedly bad. Now, if that's what's happening, and I don't know what, exactly what God's doing, but I do want to recognize the finger of God in every instance, in his word, in creation, in judgments on society, on me, making sure I'm responding in the same way. What about you? Do we want to recognize the finger of God? Let's bow our heads. Lee, can you just come a moment, please? Lee's just going to play an instrumental on the guitar. I just want you to think about not just what you've heard, but what God is doing in your life. Because the finger of God is something that you must recognize or you're in huge trouble. Don't be indifferent. Don't think it's just all one big coincidence. Don't just think, oh, this is not God. The Pharisees did that. Jesus says, you'll never be forgiven for that. Don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Don't just start to judge others. The finger of God points at all of us. What's your response to the finger of God? Are you going to turn to him? Are you going to say, yeah, this is the finger of God. God's pointing at me. I need to turn to him with all my heart. I need to start obeying God. I need to get ready to respond what God's saying. I, I need to start listening to his word. He needs to touch my ears and my mouth. I need to start speaking the goodness of God. I need to start listening to him. I need to have evil driven away from me so that I can receive the goodness of God. I don't want to be part of this world that's going to be judged and destroyed because of its sinful behavior and hatred of God. I want to love him and I want to belong to him. What's your response right now? Jesus says, if you knew the finger of God was here, you'd respond in a very different way. Well, we do know. And so we can respond to the Lord right now. In your own way right now, you just respond to the Lord. Don't be afraid of the finger of God. When Jesus put his finger on people, they just heard more clearly. They were just set free. Evil was driven from them. The demons went. The, the deafness and the muteness went. They were able to be free. The finger of God brought freedom to God's people. It brought judgment on a godless society. What's your response? Do you love the Lord? Do you belong to the Lord? Do you believe in the Lord? Are you going to obey his word? Are you going to turn to him? Well, do it right now. Don't leave it up for debate. Don't leave any room for any doubt. You respond right now. Yes, I'm going to obey the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will obey him. Just going to pause for a moment in the silence. Let the finger of God touch every life. See, the Holy Spirit, that's how he operates. When you've heard God's word, he applies his finger to you. He wants to heal you, to touch you, to set you free from evil. Jesus said to the woman, I'm not going to point my finger at you. I'm not going to judge you and condemn you, but you must leave your life of sin. respond in your own way to the Lord just give him thanks just release your worship to him just acknowledge that Jesus is Lord Father thank you for your hand just your finger the weakest part of the body Lord but your weakness is greater than man's strength Lord we turn to you once again this day Whatever's happening in society, whatever's happening in the world or our lives or around us, we submit ourselves to the hand of God, to you, to your son, Jesus Christ, so that we can obey you and we can follow you and we can serve you. 
Lord, all those submitting to you, Lord, and believing in you right now, I ask that your hand upon them will bring life, freedom, grace, and liberty. So they will be able to speak and hear and know you and recognize what you're doing in their lives this day. So, Lord, let your blessing rest upon your people. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.